Well, we're going to go ahead and get started right now. We're, we'll continue. Uh, I invite you to join me live stream if you're able to join us as well. That would be great. Again, we're talking about the DNA of leadership. We spent some time just talking di different things that make up leadership. One of the things that we're going to do tonight is I thought I would intend to do is uh, uh, just show aspects and facets of leadership. And that way we're touching on lay leadership, staff leadership, as well as lead pastor leadership, and, and create a, a, a broad perspective for us in that regard. I want to talk about leading and managing for a little bit. Talk about leading and managing. And I think we have a, a screen for that to just support it. A lot of times in the church, when, when I hear discussion on this, here, here's what I'll hurt. Oh, I'm all about a leader. I'm, God's not called me to be a manager. And somewhere in the church conversation, uh, it appears to me we have minimized the management portion. I, I, if I can, I'd like to bring a little more value to the management portion. And I'm bringing them together, managing and leading. Unlike the corporate world, you have management and then you have leadership, uh, uh, mid-level management, et cetera, et cetera, and then upward leadership. I think it's different in the church. I don't think you can separate fully leadership and management. I, I, I think they're more integrated in the body of Christ in ministry than they are in the corporate world. Great managers know what is unique about the church the setting, and about people. Management focuses on the inward. When you're looking inward, you're asking and looking and thinking through the management lens. When, when I talk to a pastor or a leader, I say, well, and he'll say or she'll say, well, at our church, this is, this is the thing about our church. And, and at our church, that wouldn't work because... They're speaking from a management perspective because they understand what's unique. Leadership focuses on what's universal and tends to focus outward. Leadership is outward, taking into the future. It's universal. It, it's across all aspects of the organization, the church, the ministry, etc., it's, it's for everybody. The leader wants everybody to go down that pathway. It's universal. But uniquely, there are things that only apply to the student ministry that don't apply to the senior citizens ministry in the church. Are you with me? That's management. There's things about the, the outreach ministry that would not apply to the kids' ministry. It's unique. That's a management versus a leadership. And I think in the church, we're doing both all the time. Now, I think it's interesting, Simon Peter. The Lord calls Simon Peter, Luke chapter 5. He's fishing, and Jesus says to Simon Peter, come follow me, and I'm going to make you what? Fishers of men. Notice that. He begins with the metaphor, fishers of men. And he brings in a catch of fish, and it is so large, what happens? The boat only almost what? Sinks. And what does he have to do? He calls John alongside, and they bring another boat, because you in the kingdom, you, don't, you can't throw anyone back. They're not our kind of people. We don't like them. No, it's all. It's all. He's willing to... Everyone come in. Everyone come to repentance. Are you with me? Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. It's fishing. It's outward. It's you know. We want them all in. In. Simon Peter, however, in John chapter twenty-one, he closes his ministry. Jesus does with a conversation with Simon Peter. What is Simon Peter doing? He's fishing, but he doesn't talk to him about fishing this time. What does he talk to them? What? Feed. Huh. 
He opens with a metaphor of fishing. He closes with a metaphor of sheep. Okay. Fishing is outward focused. Get more. Shepherding is inward focused. Take care. Now, which to Jesus says is more important? Neither. Do both. You lead and manage. Okay? Now, there's some pastors, their, their innate gift is more of shepherding. That's all right. Never apologize if yours is an inward. You're not less in the kingdom of God than anyone else. You are valuable. That's what God brought you in the kingdom to do. Your strength is going to be the shepherding. But there are others, their goal is the outreach, the casting of nets. Always get more, go deeper, push out further, go into the deep. Get more, fill this boat up and bring another boat and start another service. Open up another youth outreach. They're always adding to. It's, it's outward focus. We need them. It's both. So, uh, I, I, I want to use, if I can for a moment, this, this analogy. Okay? This is a boat. Okay? That doesn't look like a boat, though, does it? This is a motor on a boat, okay? And this is what... Is that, are, we, are we better now? Are we better? If you have a, a boat out in the water, string, go, what is behind the boat? That's called a What? Awake. Okay? If, if you see awake like that, what does it mean the boat's doing? It's going straight. If you turn to one side and you look back and you only see one, what does that mean? You're going in a circle, right? Left or right? You can tell the direction of the steering wheel by looking at the weight, can't you see? Are you following my, are you following, are you tracking with me on this? Okay. What I want to suggest to you, you can look in the same way in the church. I, I can look in, in the church. How many people are we reaching? How many people are we discipling? Now, there are times in my church the wake has turned intentionally. We, we, we were in a point where we couldn't grow. We were doing a Saturday night service. We were doing three Sunday morning services. And I was turning people away from church 20% of the time. We would say, sorry, no more seats. You have to come next Sunday. So we're not increasing numerically. During that time, guess what we did? We did no outreaches. The worst thing in the world is get 100 people come and they can't even have a seat. So we basically did no outreach. Well, God, God shut down the kingdom? No. Okay, God, your assignment is for us to build inside now. It's, an, it's going to be a shepherding, feed the sheep moment. You've ordered this. The kingdom does not stop. But as it were, our, our boat was turning and we were going and there was only one wake behind us and it was a discipling wake. We were, we were strengthening that. And then uh, we move into the new building. Guess what we ramped up? Our outreach, our focus, our reaching people. And that wake is, is very strong. And that's what we're energizing right now. I think in the church, you look at those two areas. I can look at, at, at evangelism, discipleship. I, 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 can, I can even look at effectiveness and efficiency the same way. I, I always look at how we're doing. That's why you have to have measurements. 
That's why that ministry scorecard is so important. How have we done the last year? I look at that ministry scorecard. Are we training? Are we reaching for Christ, etc.? And based upon how we've done the last year, I often use that as a projection. Okay, here's what we've got to do for the next year. And I'm, I'm using that information and projecting into the future. And I'm looking behind in order to look ahead, to steer the vessel ahead. So it's, it's, it's management and leadership, I think, is happening all the time in the church. And uh, if, if you're in a situation where you're a strong pastor that's a shepherding pastor, does that mean your church cannot grow? Absolutely not. What do you do? You, you energize the outreach in some, by a team. The church is not big enough to have a staff person to do that, lead that, uh, or, or get a team of volunteers and, and head up that ministry. Uh, the outreach ministry, you say, well, I'm the, I'm, I'm the outreach pastor. I, I love it. I win people for Christ, but discipleship's not. I, I'm always trying to reach more. And I'm the, if pastor, leader, if that's your focus, then underneath you, you need to build a team of disciplers. I think we're doing the same. And Simon Peter, Jesus starts by saying, fishers of men he ends by saying feed my sheep and he doesn't say choose whichever one you want i think he is saying do both uh, three main functions of a leader are to provide direction protection and order direction protection and order just building on the dna of leadership uh, direction that's leadership, whether you're a youth pastor, whether you're an assistant youth pastor, whether you're an intern, whether you're a lead pastor, I give the church direction. People naturally look to the leader for direction. Then protection. That's health and well-being. And then, of course, order. In fact, I could go back to this analogy. Direction and protection. Are we going? This is the vision in, a vision area, and this is... This is uh, stability and health of the church. Again, I, I, I often look at how we're doing here and it, it helps me project and look into the future of where we're going. Uh, building onto that, I want to talk about formal and informal authority for leaders, if we can. I'll go ahead and put the screens up uh, for that formal and informal authority uh, for leaders. All leaders have some kind of authority. I separated formal versus informal authority. Formal authority is what you should do. The formal authority probably comes with your position, with your title, and your job description. Even if you're a volunteer, you're a board member, this is what a board member should do. This is what a youth pastor should do. This is what a youth worker should do. This is uh, what an associate should do. This is what a pastor should do. It could be found in the bylaws, a job description, policy, manner, precedent, rules, whatever the, the pastor may outline it formal authority is what you should do anyone failing in their formal authority lacks either chemistry or competency if if i hand a staff member a, a job description this is what you should do a year later, they're not doing it. It's, it's either a chemistry or it's a competence. They don't like us. They don't like what I'm, we're doing. And they are not complying. It's a chemistry. They don't like being here. They moved here from snow country and they came to hot south Texas and they hate it. They feel like they, 
uh, left the land of paradise and, and, and went to the barren wasteland. They don't like it. They don't like this. They don't like me. They don't like church. They don't like that. Well, what? Be a chemistry issue. That happens. Okay? That, that, that can happen. Or it's a competency. I give them authority and they're not doing it. It's, uh, it's the analogy of the deer in the headlight. They don't know what to do. Okay? They don't know what to do. So if I give them authority and they're not doing what they should do, I have to ask myself the question, do, do they like us? Yeah, they like us. They, they got good chemistry. Then they probably don't know how to do it. And I have to help them. I have to build the scaffolding for them. I have to empower them through training, etc. Informal authority is what you could do. Formal authority is what you should do. Informal authority is what you could do. You could do something. Uh, informal authority comes from the person's track record, their relationship, the culture, modeling, reality, the situation. Uh, it's, it's not on their job, uh, dis, uh, their job description. It's not a policy in the church. It's not something that we said that they should do, but it is something they could do. I always want to admonish people on staff and ministry, always exceed your formal authority. I, I always am impressed when staff members don't do just what they should do, they take on something of what they could do. I like it when a staff member brings me ideas that are not on their job description. I'm impressed with that. I'm impressed when I, when I see somebody in the church, they're not even being paid, but they, they want to take on something and they say, I'd, I'd like to start a, a Bible club at high school or I, I want to do a small group or with young adults it's not something they should do it's something they see they they could do you know pastor it could happen if you listen if you listen that you'll hear that from them i don't have to do that they're talking job description okay you're you're a you're a should person if i don't type it out on the job they're not going to do it but it's the person that'll approach you in the hallway send you an email, send you a text message, talk to you, say, Pastor, you know, this could happen. You know, this could happen. And we could be doing, and we could be. Those, I, I, those are, those are high-level leaders in the, in the making. What I've noticed in a church, a uh, crisis, both in a church, if a church is in crises, there's trouble in the church, the economy's turned bad down. The oil business has gone down. Several families have left and income has, has shrunk. When a church, for whatever reason, staff member left, mad, sent, made accusations or a, a key leaders leave the church. When a cri church is in crisis, uh, formal uh, and informal authority widens. I, I, I've noticed that that happens. And, and sometimes in the crisis, the formal authority will shrink because of resources and informal authority can widen. There was a time in the church we had a crisis going on. We had an issue with a, uh, one of those horrible sin issues that happened in the leadership. So we had to we had to remove some authority. We, had, we didn't know how far it went, so we, we contracted the formal authority. No one's allowed to. No one can start. No one can change unless they get approval from the lead pastor. We were contracting formal authority because we were dealing with sin. Okay, You, you understand that that can happen. But it could happen from... The, sometimes in the, in the crisis, the formal will 
you, you sometimes need to shrink it because you're managing the crisis. But that's, that's often a time when informal authority uh, expands. And I, I think that's sometimes where great leadership can emerge in a church. You, you, you don't have the title. You weren't told to do it. You just do it. That Assuming that that informal authority, taking it on. People who fail in informal authority, I have noticed, lack either cultural fit or capacity. Okay, formal authority, it's usually chemistry and, and competency. And informal authority, uh, if they don't do things they could do, they don't accept it, they don't step up in those informal moments and assume that, it's usually a cultural fit or it's their capacity. What do I mean by that? They, they just didn't catch they, they could do that. They're out of sync with the culture. They, they, they just didn't, they didn't catch on. They had to be told to do it. It, it. it just didn't hit them. They're not in the life and the culture of how we operate as a church and it didn't. It wasn't second nature to them, or it's a capacity. They, they don't want to step up. They, they feel like, oh, wow, I just can't do that. No, oh, no not, not, not me. I, I, no, I, I couldn't take on the youth. No, I, no I, I knew we needed some pastor, and I, I, I know the, the leader of that ministry, the small group ministry stepped down, but I'm stepping out too because I just don't want to have to have all of this going on, and I, I couldn't assume, and they, they kind of get out too. That's a... That's a, they're telling you their capacity. They might have had more title and position than they had the ability to carry in that, in that situation. But in leadership, uh, in the church, there's formal authority, and I can type that out. But as, as I tell my staff, I, I, I can't put on a job description walking in the Spirit. I can't put fruit of the Holy Spirit. That part of that triangle of the spiritual gift, I can't put that on a job description. And, 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 and one of the things I've got to make sure I do, this is, this is speaking to me as lead pastor, I've got to make sure that I have enough formal authority, enough should-dos on there that I, 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 I'm putting a demand upon their talent. I don't want 65% of your talent showing up here. So my, my shoulds need to have a demand upon their talent. You, you've got you've to have some skill. You've got to continue to grow to stay here. But I need to make sure in my policy manual that I don't tamp down the informal authority where leaders can soar. Okay? You discover your eagles in the church in the informal authority area. The eagles are discovered there. The, 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 the best kept secret in your church is making sure you have enough informal authority that that person, that they're just... It's that gifting of the Holy Spirit that will take off. And wow, wow. I, I've got to have enough latitude in there that that can emerge in my church. And, and, and I can discover that great working of God in their life. And, and what I've done, now, I, I will tell you, I, I'll tell you, it, I, 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 we did this one time. I, I saw our policy manual. We, we had so many three-ring binders. I mean, we were three-ring binder heavy. And when you, when you can't do anything unless you try to find it in the binder, can I tell you what it's done? People say, I'm only going to do what I should do. And they get, they get the idea real quickly. You, you couldn't do that here. 
I, I, and, and I've heard that. I've, I've actually talked to people at conferences. Oh, no, my church, you couldn't do that. It's not, they didn't say they shouldn't do it. Listen to their language. They couldn't do that there. Oh, that couldn't work in my church. You couldn't have that kind in my church. You could, couldn't or shouldn't. I listened to the words. And I started hearing that at our church, and I'd realized we had too many three-ring binders. Okay? So we, uh, shredding day, we just put a lot of that aside. And we started reducing it to some, to some general principles, such as, it's never not your job. <laughs> that, that took a whole three-ring binder out. <laughs> if you could do it, you should do it. You know, uh, uh, we, we actually talk, that's actually language in our staff, uh, what you could. There's a few things they couldn't do and shouldn't do. We, have, we actually have a list now at your level of director, etc. And it, I can put it all on one page. I took three ring binders and threw, put it all on one page. I need enough latitude in my church that the Holy Spirit can show up in somebody's life and that spiritual gifting really kick in. Really accelerate. And when I look at my, <clears throat> I look at my wake, if, if I'm steering in a direction and I don't see it in my wake, I'll just tell you what I do. I look in-house. Okay, God, there's somebody that should be there I've overlooked. And I start looking in-house for them. There's somebody I missed. There's somebody that's not empowered. There's somebody that doesn't feel like they have the authority to do that. I, I start sniffing it out. I start, you know, I'm talking about that leadership, you know, leader, you start sniffing things out. You, you get around people and you just, you, you just start dreaming around people and see how the dreams ricochet. To see how they, see where they go, uh, see where it comes out. With that in mind, I'd like to just share three things, necessary traits for leadership. This is particularly for pastors and you have staff members. I want to share with you, I teach this to my staff and I want to share this. I have found this very beneficial. Necessary traits for leadership. Three things I think uh, staff members, pastors look for them. One, they've got to be teachable. They've got to be teachable. Uh, the one thing about ministry today, none of us are fully equipped. We're always on that continuum of learning. In order, someone said, uh, in order to arrive at where you are not, you must go the way you are not. In order to arrive at where you are not, you must go the way you are not. Uh, we, we must be teachable. Uh, people, pastors, your staff learn three ways. Analyzing, doing, and watching. You have three different kind of learners. And sometimes you think uh, the person is not paying attention. We've got to as pastors. We have got, and I say this, youth pastors, I, you've got to teach the way people learn. Uh, mul there's multiple learning styles. There's the analyzer, the doer, and the watcher. The analyzer always learns beforehand. This is the guy that reads the manual before he starts plugging it in. This is the person that studies. This is the person that wants to report. This is the person that wants the order of service ahead of time. This is the person that, that they do all their work ahead of time. That's the analyzer. This is the person that's read the financial report before we get to the meeting. They, have, they already have paper clips in it. They, they already have... That could, this is the person that says, could we get that ahead of time? I already don't. They're the analyzer. Then I have the, 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 the doers, the doing people. The doers always learn during it. One of the difficulties you'll have, if you have a training seminar for an upcoming ministry you're launching, only the analyzers will show up. And you know what you've done? The other 10 people you invited that didn't show up, you're saying they don't have a burden for it. You know what? They're not analyzed. They don't learn before. They learn doing it. They'll show up the day of it. They want to do something that day. 
They're going to say, well, if they wanted to do it, why didn't they show up? Because they are not analyzers. If I have a training center, my analyzers will show up ahead of time. I get that. I have 20 analyzers. I sent out 60 invitations. Guess what? The day we show up, 15 more are going to walk in the room. They're the doers. They're going to, I need to know that during it, while we're doing it, we're going to have training going on in real time. Because that's when my, that's when my doers get involved. And then the watchers, the watchers, uh, they're going to show up just before we put on the performance to see how it's done. And they're the person, they didn't come to the rehearsals, they didn't come to the training, they're going to come up the time you do it, and they're going to walk in. You know what, I noticed something, you could do this, and you're saying, you, I mean, why don't you, 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 why should you have anything to say about it? You weren't here when we're doing it. Can I tell you, that's how they learn. They learn by watching. When they see it in motion, they want to come up in real time, and we think, we're offended by that. How come they didn't come to the training? How come you didn't show up? These people have been here for three hours now. We've been. We, you want me to go through all this again? They are watchers. That's how they learn. Instead of being offended and pushing back by it, we just accept it. I'm going to have some people come to the training ahead of time. The day we do it, 15 more people are going to show up. And guess what? About 10 minutes before it's over, some people are going to show up and see the whole thing, and they're going to come up and give me input in it at that particular time. You're putting names to these, aren't you, right now, huh? You're saying, that's Frank. That's, oh, that's, oh, I was, they, they were, now I understand them. It's, it's, it's called in the, and if you're teachers, you know, you know multiple learning styles, okay? That would be a great book for your church to go through, the multiple learning styles concept, because that we're doing the same, that's how God wired them. Uh, we, we need to be people that allow them to teach leaders. Uh, here's what I say to leaders. Whether you're an analyzer, a doer, or a watcher, you cannot lead the way you learn. That, that's the point I wanted to get at. Leaders cannot lead the way they learn. We, we lead from our personality, but not by our personality. And this is the mistake I think so many leaders make, in my opinion. And here's what I'll say. This is my gifting. This is how God wired me. It's not about you. It's, their job is to not make you feel better, better about who you are. Ministry, team, volunteerism is, is, is not a coaching or counseling session for you to feel good and go home. I've had a good day. It's the first becomes last. Guess what? You're the leader, but the day you do it, it's not about you anymore. It's now about everybody else. We cannot lead the way we learn. I know what my learning style is, but I put that aside. It doesn't matter my learning style because it's about them. That's, I'm trying to take these people into God's future. I'm trying to maximize their potential. I'm trying to maximize who they, I'm trying to maximize the opportunity in them. Uh, the way you choose to lead is not by who you are. We have to lead differently. You learn, then you lead by their learning style. We have to be teachable. Uh, number two, they have to have the ability to receive correction. Uh, they cannot receive correction. Uh, they, they won't be a good leader. They've got to have the ability to receive correction. And somehow we've got to make correction in the church. I use the word, not cor I use the word correction and not discipline. I just like that better. I can receive correction. I don't like it. I don't like it discipline. And and I, here here's here, here's what I do. I, I, I this is a phrase in our staff. I first teach, and then I'll discipline. And teaching involves correction. You you, you have to try real hard to take me to the discipline area. I, you really do. I can go there, but that's not where I go. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a lot of energy into teaching you. And if you're not, your capacity is not going up, I'm going to first think, okay, then what we're doing is not working for you and I need to try it different because we're going to, we're going to, we're going to build a lot of scaffolding. 
and give people a chance to climb. I'm going to hold the ladder a long time to let people climb before I say, okay, we're going to do something else. So correction is very much a, a part of it. And I, I'll just tell you, uh, I think in the body of Christ, we need to do Matthew 18 more. We need to not get mad and send messages. And I, I, don't, don't, don't talk to me on social media. I, I, don't, I don't know that. Don't talk about me. Come talk to me, okay? That's what, uh, and that's how, I, here's what I tell my staff. If I ever have a problem, you won't hear about it six months from now. You'll hear about it this week. And I'm not going to be mad. I never put my fist on the table. We're going to talk about it. And here's what I'm going to say. Help me understand. There, there, there could be something I don't understand. We're going we're gonna to work through this. So, so correction, the ability to receive correction flows both ways. Okay. And then a, a servant's heart. Uh, that, that is so key. Uh, in the book, Relational Leadership, page 59, I love this quote by Wright. He says, if you're a servant to these people and serve them, they will always be your servant. I like that. Uh, you serve them. You build them up. So teachable, ability to receive correction, uh, and a servant's heart. Those are the three things I see in a staff member. That's, that's what I'm looking at. If they're, if they're teachable, but they can't receive correction, it doesn't work. Then go to seminars, I say, hey, I need you to adjust this way. No, this is the way God's called me, and this is what it is, and the Lord put this in my heart, and the Lord gave me three visions, and this is the way, and the God told me six years ago that I was going to be at a place and stand on a mountain, and you know, and I, okay, let's, if, if they can't receive correction, it doesn't matter how teachable they are. I, I, I can't give them a platform. If they're, if they're teachable and they can receive correction, but they don't have a servant's heart, doesn't work we will clash there the, that somewhere they're not going to be that they're not going to have the cultural fit with us it just is not going to happen you have a servant's heart you can receive correction but you're not teachable you still won't work your great heart love your heart you know uh you, they'll receive correction but they don't ever grow they're not teachable. They, just, they don't ever grow. Still can't. St I need all three of them. I think all three of those give you the ability to, to develop. And I will tell you, any time I have said I've got two and I pray they have the third, I've prayed them out. It just doesn't work. I, I just, if I don't see that in my staff, in the interview process. If I don't sense that, I just, it, I, it doesn't show up later. And I'll tell you, one of my spiritual gifts is I have the gift of goodbye. Yeah, yeah. I'll just say, come on, we have to have it. And, and I'll exercise that spiritual gift. It's time for you to go. Goodbye. Why? Because what we're doing is more important than personality. It just loyalty and longevity doesn't keep you there. Fruitfulness does. If it's not bringing fruit, we're having a conversation. It's not about me. It's not about my personality. It's about being fruitful in the kingdom of God. Now, let me just continue to unpack this a little bit more. Uh, Maxwell, in his book, uh, the, uh, uh, the Leader Within You, page 13, has five levels of leader. Good, good. It's worth reading. That, that, that page, page 13, is worth the price of the book. Jim Collins and his book, Good to Great, has five levels of leadership. So there's the idea of levels of leadership are, are seen in the corporate world uh, all the time. It's interesting to me that there's a five-fold ministry. Hmm. I've, even, I've even taken that and uh, merged uh, Collins a little bit with the five-fold ministry, and I can see some connection. It's almost like in, he's trying to discover what God's already put in the fivefold ministry. Uh, I, I just think that's a, a, a little bit unique there. But they, we, we recognize there's levels of leadership. Is there levels of leadership in the church, in the, in, in the New Testament? I want to suggest to you there are. 
There's two times in the New Testament that the New Testament lists the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. Two lists. Two times in the... One's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, and uh, I believe the other one is in the Gospel of Luke, if my memory serves me correct. Twice, he lists the 12 disciples. What's interesting is in both of the lists, Simon Peter is mentioned first. Did you ever notice that? In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says, and first, it actually uses that word, and first is Peter, and then it lists them. The word first in the Greek is the same word the Apostle Paul used later on when he said, I am the chief of sinners. Huh. That word first could actually be translated chief. So we could, we could literally say, here's, here's what the Holy Spirit is saying, here are the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, the chief is Peter. Now we have, we have Jesus. Then we have Peter. Then we have what we often call the, the inner circle, which is what? Peter, James, and John, right? And then we have the what? The twelve, right? Then we have the what? The seventy. And then we have the, the crowd. Are you following me? Where did Jesus spend most of his time? Then where did Jesus spend the next volume of time? And then where did Jesus spend the next? Then when did Jesus... He spent less time with the 70 and then less time in the crowd. As you go down... Jesus spends less time. In fact, the Bible will tell us that Jesus went up on the mountain. He went up on the mountain and the disciples saw him and they went up with him. And, and then the crowd went up. It's almost like he's pulling away and summons him. What I, what I want to emphasize here is in Collins, in his work, Maxwell in his work talks about levels of leadership, and I think there are levels of leadership. There are. There's that, that person that you're just, you're, you're bonded heart and mind and soul, and it, it could be a, a youth pastor has a, a youth or, or a youth leader that's that, or a pastor and a youth pastor. But then there's going to be an inner circle uh, for me, this would be an executive team. This, this for me is my executive team. This would be my staff pastors here. This would be my entire staff. And this would be my congregation. And what you, we have to be careful with well, we have to be careful and all we pass it on. Sometimes we can spend so much time on a few here, we're not putting quality time with these. And I think leaders, I'm talking about the DNA of leaders, leaders have got to understand your role. You are maximizing the potential, the opportunity, the challenges towards a purpose and advancing a goal. 
we will never get to God's goal if my staff do not have goal ownership. Some of it is taught and some of it is caught. Can I tell you? They will push my agenda in categories and titles and bullet points if I teach it. I got to have time to cast vision into them. They got to catch it for it to get in the culture of my church. And, and here's, here's what I tell my staff. My scent has to go down every hallway. Every time you enter a room, I'm entering with you. You're carrying my heart into that room. How do I get it? I, this, is, this is what I've got to spend time with right here. Okay. Now, what does that mean to you as uh, volunteers, your, your core team? If, w- anytime I see a ministry not doing well, I always go to the leaders. I always correct what's happening in the ministry by going to the leadership of it. It's, it's again, if, if the ministry's not doing well, the wake is... I, I, I don't see health and growth. Then it's the leadership that I deal with. I look behind at the health and the growth and then I fix it by the leadership. I'm always investing. We invest in this. Uh, for example, we just had an executive team retreat. We just spent time with them. Uh, I have an executive team meeting uh, once a month that I sit down with them. A half a day meeting. I meet with them every month. Okay, uh, uh, my staff, my staff pastors. We, I'm with them for a uh, what we call a step meeting once a month, and then what I call leadership advancement once a month once a month i spend 90 minutes with them training them i know where i'm taking them for the next year and a half so all of my trainings are pointing that direction so i'm always training where i'm taking them they're gonna when i get it in here when we go to launch it a year from now it's already they got the language out there i just mention it and their head's going up I just start saying it and they finish my sentences. In fact, I've got a habit when we're in staff meetings, I'll say half of a statement and I'll just pause and see if they finish it. Are they catching it? Are they catching it? I, I, I impact that this way. And then my larger staff, this is what I call my, my step meeting. And then my congregation as well. I will tell you every sermon I preach, has leadership and vision in it. They just don't know it. Every, th- this weekend, this week we're doing a five sermon series on our core values, our church, our, our, our new core value. And I'm on core value number two. Inside core value number two, I'm casting a vision to the men. They don't even know it. I'm, I'm seeding vision to them of something we're going to be doing for the next year. I, 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 I never waste a moment I, in fact, I'll look at a sermon and I'll say, is, am I speaking not just to the hurting and the wounded, am I speaking to the leaders? I always make sure in, in that my sermons have a, have a net and have a shepherd's staff in it. I'm, I'm casting a net for those who need to come to God, growth, bringing them to Christ. But I always make sure that there's a, a shepherd's staff in there there's health, and I, I'm, I'm doing both at the same time. So, so what does that mean to you as the leaders that uh, w- whatever God's gifted you, make sure you're widening your leadership conversation uh, with your people? Uh, if you'll bring up the next screen, the law of the minimum. I teach this to my staff. I want to bring this to your attention. The law of the minimum. Let me cover this and then we'll take a quick break. I don't know if you've ever heard of the law of the minimum, but the law of the minimum was first discovered, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, in the 19th century. I think it was the 19th century. The law of the minimum was discovered actually in the uh, farming agricultural business. 
And that's, that is to say uh, that what a, a seed will produce, you plant seed in soil, you can have good, rich soil, plenty of sunshine, but if you don't give it enough water, the one thing it lacks, the law of the minimum, will pull the entire produce of the field down to that level. So if it needs uh, a certain amount of water, but you only put half of that, you will expect a very poor crop. Even if the soil is rich, fertilizer, and plenty of sun, the one thing that's missing will pull the whole thing down, the law of the minimum. The law of the minimum says uh, that you can have you can have a, a great location for a church, great staff, good music, the church not grow. There's the one thing that pulls everything down. The law of the minimum. In fact, here's what I argue. They didn't discover this in the 18th century. It's been in Scripture all along. Do you know the law of the minimum is in the Bible? A little bit of leaven... What happens? Leavens the whole lump. One little, one little bit of leaven will affect all of the, le the whole bread. It will all become leavened. The law of the minimum. So what it says, it says you can be strong in eight areas, weak in one. The highest level of your weakness will be the highest level of the whole. Doesn't matter if you've got great music and a great location. If you're missing in one area, everything comes down and you cannot grow beyond that. And it's illustrated by this. If, if that is a, a 50 gallon bucket right there, barrel, and at the 30 gallon level, there's a slat out doesn't matter if the whole barrel is 50 gallon capacity because the slat is out at the 30 gallon level. You will never get 50 gallons of water. The law of the minimum. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. So what it says in, in our ministries, okay, in our ministries, I, I'm now, let, me, let me take it into a leadership discussion. Okay? That's why I say loyalty and longevity does not keep you there. We can have great potential. There could be lost people, people coming to our church, and our church can have great potential, but because brother and sister nice are serving and they're, 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 they're impacting the whole ministry and we won't pull them out of the way because they're brother and sister nice. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. They're nice. But they're not fruitful. It's the law of the minimum. This is why I tell you I have the gift of goodbye. I will do everything I can to do to lift a staff member up, to pull them up to their capacity. But if they can't do it, I owe it to them and I owe it to the kingdom of God that we cannot have capacity to reach a thousand people for Christ and there's this one person that just can't, won't, unable, they, don't, they just can't do it, then I need to make the decision. They can't do it. And I see in Scripture, there's the chief, there's an inner circle, there's leaders, there are people that belong here, belong here, belong here, belong here, and belong here. And I think we've got to recognize that as lead. I want to have the scaffolding for them to climb. But at the end of the day, fruitfulness overrides my preference. There's people I like. There's, there's people I, I like them to be there. They're easy. That's usually a warning sign for me. Because I will always choose people like me. 
my church doesn't need another Jim Ryan. My God, that church doesn't need another Jim Ryan. I tell you, and I, it's very easy. Have you ever seen churches that all the staff have the same giftings? Uh, have you said? And, and their signature is this. Oh man, that church is the whatever church, the music church or the this church or the whatever church. They have clustered all around one gifting. So all of them in them. Boy, they could be so much better. If they, can I tell you, people will come to my church and say this. You come and visit my church and you're going to say, you're going to walk away and say, I don't get how they do that, man. Oh, look, and we do a much better job at it in this area than they do, and we do it better. You're probably right. You're probably right. But there's an area that we do so much better than you, and that's the difference. You could be this much better in one area, but you're this much lower in another area. Guess what? The law of the minimum will say you will only reach this many people. You can only contain this many people. It's not how good you are in these. What's the one blind spot that's pulling everything down? Leaders, we got to know that. Leaders, we've got we got to say, and you've got to almost see it in yourself. Okay, I know what I am. There's a law of minimum in me. Can I tell you? There, there is a law of minimum in me. I know in some areas, I, I don't. Have, I'm not a music person. Okay. When we get to the district office, Pastor Tim always has a song, okay? And we, we'll go through and he'll say, you know what, just remind me of a song. I can't, I can't remember the songs we sang last Sunday. I can't. Hum one song you sang last Sunday. It, I don't know. It was something about he's good and he's great and it kind of had blue and, and it, I can't even, I can't even hum it. I ain't humming, man. I just, that's the law of minimum. I know I'm not good at that. Okay? And you know what I'll do? I'll just tell you, when they, when they bring their music budget in, when I first see it, I need to be in the room, room alone. Because for, for three minutes, I'm venting. What do you mean? My God, what I could do with that. My, you talking about this? They want another one? Why do they need another one? And I had to do, Okay. Then I bring him in. You know, I so appreciate that what you're doing for God and setting high goals. <laughs> I know, man. Oh, I don't get it. That's not mine. I know that. And because I know that, I don't lead out of that. My church would be an upheaval out of that. I, see, I know that in me. So I have to bring somebody in my whole church that brings that up and I have to I have to validate them and here's here's something you'll hear my my staff will hear me say to them uh, on a regular basis I need you because you're better at it than I am I, t I tell them that I told my staff here recently you know we do our financial report and it uh, this is what we have a a depreciation, we always have to figure depreciation in. We depreciated X amount of thousands of dollars. Our buildings wore out a little bit more and our da 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 you know, all that, you know, financial people, you know. Here's what I here, here's what I tell my staff. Here's what I told them recent, recently. The the one asset that appreciates every year is you. And the and, and it's you're not on the financial page, but you're on my page. And that you're, you're the one appreciating asset we have that this church couldn't operate without you. You're, you're filling in my minimum and you're making sure that as a church we're not controlled by a minimum. I Remember I told you I put a demand upon their talent? I also put a demand upon their gift. I told our staff here recently, I said, let me tell you where we're going. You won't carry it with the same prayer life that you did in 2015. I put a demand upon their gifting. Not their talent, their spiritual gift. I got to have leaders that function in discernment. 
we can't make bad choices. We can't put, I can't put people in leadership and find out junk in their life later and now have the whole youth, youth group doing it. I, I, I can't do it. I need you. I, I'm putting a demand upon their spiritual gifting. You need to be, you need to be people of discernment. I'm raising the spiritual minimum in our church. You find you following with me? Okay. I'd like you to reflect on this. And I wondered how I was going to do it at this moment. But here's how I'm going to do it. We're going to take a break. I'm going to pitch it to you, and here's the question. What in you? I want you to criticize your church. No, don't do that. You're not here to criticize. In you, what's your minimum? You, you, you already know it. Focus on that. Why don't we take a five-minute break, and they will pick up from there.